So it's a very interesting question about exactly what is seasonal affective disorder. It's, it's actually a disorder that clinicians have only really been uh, tuned into for the, maybe the past 25 years or so. And it has to do with the fact that it's been recognized that there are many people who, linked to the seasons, will have changes in their mood and, and associated problems. So for instance, the most common form of this occurs in the winter months. Uh, and people will start to lose energy, may sleep a little more, changes in their appetite, and may have more clear-cut feelings of depression. Uh, usually it's thought to be very closely linked to our to the light cycle. So that in the winter months, the days become shorter, uh, there's less daylight that we're exposed to. Occasionally people actually may have the, the flip of this where uh, it's during the, the summer months this may be linked, or, or in particular a little more common form of this is in the spring, summer months, as the days are very long, people may actually may experience more anxiety, may sleep less, uh, may have lots of excess energy. So we can see the, the flip side of this as well. So these are, these are disorders, changes in mood and affect that are particularly linked to the time of the year. And the general feeling is it's actually linked to the, the light cycles. The symptoms of seasonal affective disorder actually uh, can vary a little bit from individual to individual, and they can also vary according to the degrees of severity. So some folks may have very mild symptoms, others may have more significant and uh, noticeable problems. Sometimes they're just more physical types of things. Uh, a loss of energy, uh, a lack of interest, a lack of motivation, uh, increasing tiredness, fatigue. People may find that they're actually sleeping a little bit longer than they might, say, during the summer months. Uh, and people may also then have some changes in their mood, uh, so not necessarily frank depression, but sometimes it may be, uh, get to the point of being what we would call a major depressive uh, type of disorder. Uh, so the symptoms can vary a little bit, uh, but usually they incorporate aspects of what we generally consider to be depression, depressed mood, and some of the associated physical symptoms that are associated with, with depression very often. So the people who are most at risk for this seasonal affective disorder, first of all, a lot of it is dependent upon where we live. Uh, so the people who are more, living in areas that are more susceptible, more exposed to these fluctuations in, in time, in, in light exposure, uh, particularly the in our case in the northern uh, latitudes, uh, like Boston area, even for the places further north are more susceptible. And those are places where uh, in the summertime there may be very long days, lots of sunlight, but in the, the consequences also in, in the uh, winter months, the days become very short and our light exposure is much sh shorter. And so those are the folks who are particularly prone to us. A lot of it has to do with geography. And then if you're in an area where your light exposure is even further diminished because of cloudy overcover, perhaps you're even more susceptible. Most people uh, perhaps are exposed to this to some degree. It's thought that perhaps maybe in northern latitudes up to 9, 10 percent of the population may have uh, some form of this. Now some of them may be very mild and some of them may be more significant where people actually become quite depressed. Treatment of seasonal affective disorder, perhaps, I, I would think that the number one uh, the, and the most important factor in being able to treat this is to identify it. I think that very often it's because it's seasonal, people will not identify it as such. Oftentimes they'll, they'll attribute it not just to the seasonal changes, but because seasons also are associated with other times, uh, other anniversaries holiday season, family exposure, and so forth. So very often times it's, it's easy to attribute to things other than this, what we now consider to be a seasonal affective disorder. Uh, as I said, first it's identification. And actually, in some ways, most of the things that we use to treat depression are effective here. Uh, so perhaps uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, certainly the medications that we would traditionally use to treat depression, uh, the antidepressants in particular, are, are very effective in treating the seasonal affective disorder. The one thing that's, that's been of particular interest to, to clinicians is that in addition, being aware that light seems to play a role in this. And so exposing people to a bright light, 
uh, very often bright light therapy is, is the sort of thing that's, that's used. Uh, it's thought that perhaps the bright light being early morning bright light exposure may be a little more effective than the evening, but perhaps both may have some benefits. And so this light exposure is key. Uh, people, we don't, we're not oftentimes not aware how dark uh, a life we, we lead, lead and how little light exposure we actually get. Uh, I usually try to get pe people just to be aware of this and even in their natural environment to, to make to increase the amount of light that they're exposed to and to sometimes getting additional light boxes that, that, that will allow you to have exposure to brighter light uh, over a shorter period of, a short period of time that can be also very effective. There are steps that people can take to sort of minimize or prevent this seasonal affective disorder. Uh, particularly we've been focusing mostly on the depressive forms that occur with the winter months. And I think that you have to remember that this is something that occurs on a regular basis. So once the person identifies that they're susceptible to this, there's some predictability as to when symptoms will start. And if you can anticipate them and predict them to any extent, it gives you a leg up. Because now, if you find that, that increasing light exposure is going to be helpful to you, you have the opportunity to start that before you become symptomatic. Uh, starting it sometimes in around October, actually, may be a, perhaps an optimal time to start thinking about this uh, to avoid getting depressed. Because once, once you start, people start getting depressed and losing motivation, then oftentimes, paradoxically, they'll lose motivation to, to, to treat it. Uh, the other thing to remember is, is that in some ways, uh, the thing that, that makes it seductive for us to, not, to avoid is that they, this almost by definition, it will resolve by itself. If we don't do anything, it'll resolve. But it would be nice to just overall quality of life to minimize the, the effects and, and to anticipate it and, and try to prevent it from happening.